Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, I'd like to talk to you a little about uh, what we're doing at the OSPAR Convention in terms of uh, assessing the marine environment uh, as a whole and also focusing on particularly the, our uh, sub-region, Buen Arctic Waters, and, and what we are trying to do in collaboration with other organizations to improve our ability to assess the environment in the future. So for those of you who haven't heard of the OSPAR Convention before, we're officially the Convention for the Protection of the Marine Environment at the Northeast Atlantic. Um, we have the aims to prevent pollution, to protect the marine environment from the adverse impacts of human activities and to conserve marine ecosystems. Um, we try to follow the ecosystem approach, so look, taking a holistic view on the marine environment and how human activities affect that to try and reduce their pressure. And we follow the same key principles that are kind of enshrined in UN agreements and United Nations Law of the Sea. Um, we have 16 contracting parties, including the European Union, and we actually cover quite a wide sea area, so uh, as well as the Arctic region, we cover uh, areas beyond national jurisdiction right out into the mid-Atlantic, as well as the more heavily used regions of the North Sea, Celtic Seas, and Iberian Coast. And uh, when I was preparing for this, um, I was, wanted to think a little bit about what changes were happening in the Arctic, and I think my previous speakers have already very aptly explained some of the changes in terms of uh, the climate, the oceanography, what's happening to particularly uh, biodiversity. We have a northward uh, shift of species. We have new threats coming in for what's uh, already threatened and declining species that are in that area. And we also have a, a change in human activities. We've, in the previous session, we had uh, interesting talks looking at how the shipping industry is changing in the Arctic region. Well, we definitely have more oil and gas exploration. Even in some parts of northern Russia, we're now having floating nuclear power production in the high Arctic um, in the near future. And we have new pressures, which are also at the global scale, such as marine litter and, and underwater noise. Uh, of course, we cover a small part of the Arctic, but within OSPAR, we always are looking to collaborate with other organizations to, to take in that holistic approach. And as part of that, we've recently uh, become observers also to the Arctic Council, so we can work uh, more closely in collaboration with, with its working groups, such as CAF on biodiversity, uh, PAME on the marine environment, um, and, and AMAP on monitoring and assessment. Um, within OSMAR, we have uh, a mandate to protect the marine environment, but there's some areas we, we don't cover, and, and one of those is fisheries. So we work very closely with our regional uh, agreements on fisheries, uh, such as the Northeast Atlantic Fisheries Commission, uh, through a collective arrangement to work jointly on um, areas in beyond national jurisdiction where we both share competence for protecting the marine environment. Um, one of the areas in recent years where we've really moved forward our, our ability to assess um, both biodiversity and impacts on the marine environment is uh, our not very sexually named Intermediate Assessment uh, 2017, which was uh, very ably coordinated by the chair of the session here, uh, Professor Moffat. And, and it's looked at a, a large range of indicator-based assessments covering the main uh, areas uh, or themes of the OSPAR Commission, which is biodiversity, uh, including human activities, uh, eutrophication, hazardous substances, offshore industry, and, and radioactive substances. And although the focus of that assessment for some of the indicators, because it contributed to the EU Marine Strategy Framework Directive, was more in the North Sea region, uh, these assess some of the assessments, such as those for marine mammals, um, uh, uh, seabirds, and, and pressures, were conducted in the Arctic area, but they provide a basis that we can use for our, our future assessment in that area. And particularly biodiversity was one of the areas where, for the first time, we really started moving forward. In our last quality status report in, in 2010, we had 10 assessments and we're moving forward to look at a, a wide range of ecosystem elements, so that's uh, pelagic and benthic habitats and the impacts on them from, from fishing. Uh, also looking at uh, changes in, in fish communities with uh, management of fish stocks, um, and looking at uh, other areas such as marine mammals. And we plan to continue on that basis. Um, you'll find the, the results of all these assessments on, on our website. 
But as we look forward to our next major um, assessment of the marine environment in 2023, which will also include a bigger focus on the Arctic area, we plan to continue that indicated approach with a plan for over 65 assessments, which will be uh, quite uh, a challenge for the incoming Secretariat, I'm sure. Um, we also have a commitment to assess a range of human activities and their impacts on the marine environment. You'd be glad I'm not going to go through the whole list here, but I think we've seen some already that have been highlighted in the, uh, that are expanding into the Arctic region, whether that's uh, fisheries or shipping, aquaculture, and some pressures such as uh, underwater noise and marine litter, which I'll, I'll come to in a moment. Um, of course, if you have uh, increased shipping in, in the Arctic, that is also going to lead to an increase in uh, oil and hazardous substances. Even with the polar code, it's inevitable that we will have accidents in this area. And there's a, a unique set of challenges in, in dealing with preparedness, prevention and response. Um, OSPAR doesn't do that, but we, have, we provide the secretariat for our sister organization, the Bonn Agreement in, in the North Sea. And particularly there, we're collaborating on uh, environmental risk assessment uh, and through our um, partners in Norway with the Arctic Council EPPR um, group to uh, improve the understanding of where the risks are and what impact that has on the marine environment. Um, one area where OSPAR uh, is the competent authority is it's regulating the offshore oil and gas industry. Um, we've been doing that for many years in, in the North Sea and also in uh, the, the OSPAR Arctic region in the uh, Northeast Atlantic. Um, bringing in measures such as uh, reducing the emissions of um, offshore chemicals or substituting them, um, reducing the amount of uh, dispersed oil in, dis um, in produced water discharged from installations um, uh, and identifying chemicals for, for substitution. And I think uh, that, that, along with the assessment of those discharges, um, sets a, a, a good example for regulation that could perhaps be extended to other areas within the Arctic region. Um, of course, one of the impacts uh, of continued oil and gas exploration and, and an expansion northwards is the introduction of impulsive noise through seismic surveys. These cover quite a wide area and uh, are increasingly happening within the Arctic region. Um, as part of the intermediate assessment, for the first time we assessed the, the pressure from these impulsive noise sources within the Ospar region. Uh, they also include uh, activities like pile driving or underwater explosions. And we're currently developing uh, uh, a new uh, indicator to actually look at the impact, because this is the first time that the distribution of underwater, um, um, impulsive underwater sounds has been collected, but now we want to actually understand what impact is that having on key species um, within the Ospar region and, and particularly also uh, up into the Arctic. Um, in 2015, we agreed a ambient noise monitoring str uh, strategy, so that's looking at the introduction of noise from shipping um, through a combination of monitoring and modeling. Um, and we have uh, a program to bring that into the different OSPAR regions. We're starting in the North Sea region, because obviously that's the most highly trafficked area, but we plan to extend that into the OSPAR um, Arctic region in the near future. And that's particularly important because uh, within OSPAR, we also have a, a list of threatened and declining species. There's over 60 species there where we need to take um, priority measures to reduce the impact of um, human activities on these species. And uh, in uh, the Arctic region, uh, some of the species that are listed only in that region, particularly like uh, the, the great whales, such as the northern right whale here, have uh, underwater noise as one of the key impacts on them, both from impulsive and ambient noise. So we need to understand better the distribution of noise and any increases caused by new human activities. Um, we're also uh, currently developing a methodology to look into uh, doing status and trend assessments in the populations and distributions of these animals. In fact, I'm going to a meeting directly after this uh, at Marine Scotland here uh, in Edinburgh to, to discuss that this week looking at not only impacts from, from underwater noise, but also from climate change. And uh, that's another area where we're hoping to um, expand our uh, ability to assess the marine environment. We have a commitment in the OSPAR strategy to monitor and assess uh, the nature, uh, rate and extent of climate change, and particularly ocean acidification. 
um, we adopted uh, an ocean certification strategy based on a joint working group with the uh, ICES. And um, we're now hoping to take that forward in the near future in collaboration with Arctic Council AMAP uh, uh, working group on monitoring to really get a better understanding to the, the change in ocean acidification right across the OSPAR area, but particularly, as was mentioned earlier, the, the rapid change in, in the Arctic. Uh, finally, one of the areas which is very high on the political agenda in the press at the moment is, is marine litter, um, an area which I've personally been working in for a long time. We have a commitment to reduce that, uh, the levels and quantities in the Northeast Atlantic. And in fact, as part of our collaboration with the Arctic Council, uh, one of the first areas we're working on is uh, the joint project to assess uh, marine litter uh, in the Arctic region and, and look at next steps to reduce that. And one of the reasons why OSPAR are so keen to be involved is when you look at uh, the ocean circulation, you can see that actually, although um, uh, that a lot of the litter is actually generated in, in the North Sea region or in the highly densely populated areas, but with the, the ocean currents, we're actually transporting that to the Arctic region. And we have various assessments, um, particularly for the Arctic region, looking at, at beach litter, which highlight that plastics is particularly a problem in the Arctic. In, in most areas, plastics make up about 90% of marine litter, but in the Arctic, that's more like 96, 97%, and a lot of that is transported north. So to actually tackle the issue within the Arctic region, we actually need to solve the problem further south in, in Europe. And we'll be continuing to expand our monitoring network. Uh, in the last few years, we've added monitoring sites in Iceland and East Greenland to have a better understanding, uh, not only the distribution of litter, but also which, which types of, uh, of litter we're getting so we can focus the measures to reduce those specifically. So thank you very much for letting me uh, give that introduction. Obviously, there's a lot more in our intermediate assessment and on the website if you want to see what we're doing on monitoring assessment. Thank you.